Well, good afternoon and welcome to all, particularly all guests that are here today. Your presence is a blessing. All of us now together as one, as we hear St. Paul tell us today, one together in Christ they are offering this Mass. Uh, a special welcome to the men that have been on the Acts retreat that concludes with this, with this Mass. That we've been lifting you up in prayer the entire time uh, that the seeds of grace, the seeds of the Holy Spirit being sown into you, uh, planted in you, will bring forth a wonderful harvest. We also wel uh, welcome today a uh, special guest, uh, Josh Turbo, a son of this parish who is uh, in formation at St. Mindred School of Theology, uh, for preparation for the priesthood. It's an honor to have him serve at the altar today. My thanks to the youth of this parish who uh, last week took part in Catholic Heart Work Camp up in Minnesota. They arrived safely back uh, uh, yesterday morning. Thank you for your witness to Christ and also for those adults that, were, that traveled with them. My thanks also to the prayers that you offered while I was away. I left last, early last Sunday morning and went up to St. Meinrad, the seminary that I attended. Uh, went there for a, a, a seminary class reunion and got back on, uh, late on Wednesday. Uh, it was very good to be there and uh, reconnect with several of my classmates uh, for the 25th anniversary of our ordinations of the priesthood. And one of the things I was there looking at those photographs of ourselves uh, when we were in our late 20s, early 30s, and then looking up at the men sitting around me at the table, looking at these guys in their 50s, and thinking, boy, how did this happen? And how it happened so fast. But I'm glad I made that trip. And I'm also glad to be back with you today. That's what a parish priest should be always looking forward to Sunday to be with the people, especially with the offering of the Sun Sunday Eucharist. But I'm glad especially for two reasons today. The first reason is that we begin to hear today uh, what's referred to as the bread of life discourse in the Gospel of John chapter 6. That is, that, that chapter was crucial for me becoming a Catholic a number of years ago. And we're going to hear the entire chapter, it's about 70 some odd verses, over the next, this Sunday, in, uh, in the next four, five Sundays in a row. Because it's the core of the Catholic belief in the, about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That the Word of God becomes flesh, the Incarnation, and the Eucharist is the sacramental extension of the Incarnation. That Christ being present to us. God's over-the-top crazy love for us in Jesus Christ. So I encourage all of us to be reading John chapter 6 over this period of these five Sundays, not only hearing it at Mass, but also to read it uh, uh, at home with the, with the old school and break out the, the Bible and to read it or on your phone or whatever, whatever works for you to do that. As we are entering into this special, uh, special teaching uh, from Jesus about, about the Eucharist. Now the chapter begins with this miraculous feeding of 5,000 plus with only five loaves of bread and two fish. We want to make clear that we understand is it's a miracle. It's not that Jesus guilts people into giving up the food they've hoarded, you know, that sandwich that's stuck back in, the, in, in, the, uh, uh, in their bag, and everybody shares. Well, sharing is caring, that's nice, but that's not what's happening. It's a miracle. And Jesus spends the rest of the chapter explaining what this miracle means, that he is the bread of life. Now, a little bit of a spoiler alert, the chapter ends with many of his disciples rejecting this. And they reject him. They turn their backs upon him, they leave him, they abandon him, and they go back to their former way of life. Now, more on that in the Sundays to come. You know, I, there's so much to, to preach about on John chapter 6, I have to remind myself, okay, you got five Sundays. You don't try to do it all in one, in one shot. You've got to pace yourself. You've got to stretch it out. That's reason number one special to be here today. Reason number two, today is a church in Oklahoma for the first time. We celebrate the memorial of Blessed Father Stanley Rother. The prayers to the Mass, specifically for him, they take the place of, this, of the regular uh, uh, prayers for, the, for this Sunday. For those who, who may not know, may have guests from elsewhere, from uh, out of state, Stanley Rother is the first U.S.-born priest to be beatified. He's the first U.S. born citizen to be declared a martyr. He's the first Oklahoman to receive this honor from the church. He's the Oklahoma farm boy, the priest and missionary and martyr who was beatified in Oklahoma City at a special mass last September, which was the biggest Catholic whoop-de-doo the state of Oklahoma has ever seen. 
for those of you who are there or maybe who couldn't get there and couldn't get in or had to watch on the big screen. And today he is being honored as a saint in his native place, Oklahoma, as well as in Guatemala, where he was martyred. Now, the Charlotte Center here at St. Benedict's is named after him, as at Blessed Father Stanley Rother, I think the first place in the diocese to have this to be named, named for him. And I understand that Father Joe Townsend, being very far-sighted, when he ordered those letters to be made, he also ordered the letter S and the letter T. I bet it's been told, so it's like anticipating the upgrade, you know, <laughs> when he gets from beatification to canonization, he's honored as a saint to the church universal. And I have to share something special with you. I've been waiting my entire priesthood to do what we're doing today. I remember asking, praying, it's like, Lord, give me the gift of living long enough to celebrate the feast day of blessed Stanley Rother. And now I'll be praying that the Lord will give me the gift of living long enough to celebrate the feast day of Saint Stanley Rother. So it is a great blessing for us to come here today to celebrate his witness to Christ in his priesthood, asking for his intercession, also that we pray for his canonization. Now, when I was away up in Indiana at this alumni reunion, it wasn't, not, not, not all of it was about sharing stories of the past with my classmates and getting caught up uh, with the things in the present. I also attended a couple of lectures that were being offered, one of them by Father Mark O'Keefe. He's a Benedictine monk and priest of St. Minor at Arch Abbey. He is a teacher at the seminary and also was my spiritual director for a couple of years. And he gave a talk about the virtues of courage and of hope, which I think are important to hear and to share, particularly today. Courage, we should think of it as what we build up, that virtue that we build up with God's help. Hope is a virtue that God gives us, but we have to claim it for our own. Virtue, as St. Thomas Aquinas put it, virtue is the habitual disposition of doing good that we build up over time so that we can do the good with greater ease. I mean, the more that we practice it, the easier it becomes. I'll give you an example of the virtue of honesty. If we are in the habit of routinely telling the truth, it becomes easy to tell the truth and becomes more, more difficult to lie. Now, the reverse is true as well, the vice of being dishonest. If we are in the habit of being dishonest, it becomes very easy to lie. It becomes more, much more difficult to be truthful. Now, there are four cardinal virtues that we recognize uh, as Catholics, cardinal, virtue, cardinal meaning the hinge that things turn upon, the virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and of courage. Aquinas also talked about courage as being that sustained ability to face the obstacles in order to do good. Basically think of it as we're going to stick to it. We're going to overcome the obstacles to do the good. And the martyrs are the greatest example of the virtue of courage. Now, when I think of the word courage, probably what comes to my mind the quickest is that heroic kind of courage. Think of firefighters. Remember after 9-11 about the, the, the praise that was, that was rightly shown to the first responders, the people that when the building catches on fire, you and I are trying to get out, well, they're running in to save people. That's heroic courage. But Aquinas also recognized that there's a different kind of courage, that is, that the virtue of courage is most often expressed in less extreme moments, and we called it enduring courage. That's most often expressed in the ordinary ways of the difficulties of daily life. It's the daily challenge to do the good. Think of it this way. It's the perseverance to keep going, to keep the good before us. I'll give you some examples. It means working at a job that you may not like. You may not like the hours, you may not like the people you work with, you may wish things were different, you got paid more. But bills got to be paid. Food's got to be put on the table. Children got to be educated. So you go to work. That's enduring courage. Another example would be patients that are under uh, taking chemotherapy treatments. And also their caregivers, they keep going back for one treatment, over and over again, that's enduring courage, keeping the good before them. Or it's that caring for that elderly 
or dying parent, spouse, sibling, or friend that's enduring courage. Keeping the good before us. And otherwise, if we don't keep the good before us, then we weaken. And prayer is essential to keep the good before us, to keep going. And that's where the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is so essential for us in our Catholic faith. To keep us going. Blessed Stanley Rother had enduring courage to keep going. Seeing the goal of the good before him, and many of you know his story, he was not the guy that in school there in Okarchi that everybody thought, oh yeah, he's going to be the priest. Everybody thought he's going to be the farmer. Shocked people when he said he was going to the seminary. But he persevered. He persevered in the seminary even though he flunked out of the first seminary he went to in San Antonio. By the way, that, that same seminary claims him now as an alum. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I, the thing about it, it's like, okay, I was like, wait a minute, you're the, you're the ones who told Bishop Reed to, hey, send this kid back to the farm. He didn't have a vocation, but I guess what? We all want to ride the wave. And I said, that's all right. But Rother persevered. He had that enduring courage to overcome the obstacles. And also, after he was ordained, apparently he was not highly thought of by some of his brother priests. They didn't see him as the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he persevered. He also then persevered as a missionary in an isolated town in Guatemala, Santiago Titlan, being amongst the poorest of the poor in one of the poorest places in the hemisphere, which he suffered repeatedly from illnesses, but he persevered also to become fluent in the native language. And the native language is not Spanish, it's a Mayan dialect called Zutihil. And I've been to Santiago Titlan, I've heard Zutihil, and it sounds something akin of something like on Star Trek. This deep, guttural language. The only word I could understand was amen. <laughs> Rother had enduring courage. And he persevered over time, with God's grace, to fall deeply in love with Jesus Christ and with the people he was sent there to serve as their priest, standing with them in the midst of the civil war that was tearing Guatemala apart during the 70s into the 80s. And when that violence began to come to that part of Guatemala that he lived, priests and religious were specifically being targeted, mostly by the government. He stayed with them. And even when he was forced to leave on the orders of the Archbishop of Oklahoma City, he then pleaded to go back. You know, he's famous for saying the shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger and abandon the sheep. And that enduring courage built up over time with God's help transformed into heroic courage. They reached a high point on July 28, 1981, the night in which three men entered the rectory of that parish church and shot him dead. Giving us the great example of the virtue of courage as a martyr. That's why the vestments today are red and testimony to his blood shed out of love for Christ and the love he had for his people as their priest. The virtue of courage aids us in the virtue of hope. As I said, God gives it, but we have to claim it for our own. Father Mark, in his talk the other, the, this last week, he said the gift of faith allows us to reach out to God, but we have to build on that gift of faith each day. Faith is not a light switch. It's not a button that we can push or something we can turn on as we need it. Rather, we build it up for the day in which we truly need it. We build up our faith, particularly we should see it as we build up our faith through the gift of the Eucharist. One of the things that has impressed me the most in the short time I've been here is when the people go in the Acts retreats, those who are not going, you go to the chapel and you pray before the Blessed Sacrament for those on retreat. And also this time of the retreat, the men that they had adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. That's building up that faith day after day. Hope is trust in God. God will sustain. God will do it, not ourselves. And hope raises our eyes above the present suffering. Blessed Stanley was a man of hope because he said that he hoped that his staying with his people in the midst of the danger would somehow bring about the good. Even his death, he hoped, 
would do so if it came to that. Now, the opposite of hope is despair. And closely related to despair is discouragement. If our faith is shaken, if we have been discouraged, then it's a sign that we have placed our trust not in God, but in something or someone else. And today, as a church in this country, we are in need of the virtues of courage and hope. As many of you know, Theodore McCarrick, the retired Archbishop of Washington, D.C., and one of the most influential bishops in the United States, was recently removed from public ministry by Pope Francis. The reason is that there are credible and multiple accusations going back for decades of his misconduct, which brought harm to children, seminarians, and young priests that were entrusted to his care. And yesterday, he resigned as a cardinal. He will be put under trial by the church to determine what further punishment is merited. For those of us who lived through the scandal of 2002 and who believe that this is all now behind us, the recent events with McCarrick are a great shock. It is, at least for me. And it's tempting to fall into discouragement. And discouragement literally means the removal of cur that virtue of courage. It's easy to fall into that or also to fall into cynicism, especially as similar news about other cases come to light, and they will, from other places. But remember the virtue of courage, the sustained ability to face the obstacles to do the good. And the good that needs to take place now, I believe, is clear. Now, if you follow me on social media, I've not been quiet about this, and now I'm going to say it from the pulpit. I say, let the purge continue. The purging of the McCarrick's in the church. This malignancy that infects the body of Christ must be removed, regardless of how long it takes, regardless of the cost. And not only the offenders, but also those, including those in the hierarchy, who knew and remained silent for whatever reason and did nothing. As you might guess, I'm disgusted. I don't think you need to be told that there are good, there are good deacons, there are good priests, there are good bishops. I pray when it's all said and done, I could be counted among their number. I also believe that our bishop, Bishop David Condrelet, is a good bishop. I think you know that. But I also hope that it is good for you to know that there are clergy who are as disgusted as you are over this malignancy that infects the body of Christ. And now it is time for the virtue of enduring courage to keep the good before us. All of us, laity and clergy, all of us, young and old and in between, all of us, to have courage. There have been bishops who have failed us, who have failed to show courage, who have failed to be faithful to Christ. Therefore, we, as baptized disciples, must take up the slack. We need the enduring courage of a Stanley Rother. We need to persevere in prayer, in worship, of sharing the joy and truth of our faith, particularly in the Eucharist, of encouraging one another. And to encourage means literally to put the virtue of courage into one another and do so with the spirit of humility, of gratitude, what St. Paul tells us today. And also to the virtue of hope, of raising our eyes above the present suffering, just as blessed Stanley did. It has been said that not all of us are called to be martyrs, but all of us, all of us, are called to be faithful. All of us are called to desire holiness, or at least to have the desire, to have the desire to be holy. Through Jesus, the, the bread of life, may this desire in us be nurtured. Through the intercession of blessed Father Stanley Rother, missionary, priest, and martyr, may we persevere in that desire with courage and hope.